So the story that you've heard so far about Lisa is, is a typical story. It's an interesting story. It's a good story. It's virtualizing to support testability, right? It's reducing those dependencies on unstable systems or trying to define those performance parameters of an interface to match a target environment or a potential target state. That's not what I'm going to talk about at all. So I'm going to go in a totally different direction. Um, Lisa is really, in, in, in that story, about how to make your life easier as a developer or as a tester, right? It's how you overcome challenges of delivery or limitations presented to you. I'm going to talk about how you start from a totally different point and actually don't have to deal with those limitations because you're starting from a totally different uh, space. Some of you may kind of scoff at the concept of Agile SOA, but that's what I'll talk about a lot today. Um, you might think that Agile and SOA are kind of two different worlds, right? We have all the canonical message construction in SOA. We have uh, tight contracts. We have centralization of services, and we have that wonderful mythical organizational contradiction, the center of excellence, right? Nothing is excellent at the center. That's the bell chart. That's where the mean is. Nothing excellent happens in the middle. It all happens at the edges. So I'm going to talk about some edge cases. You won't be doing this with all of your teams. We don't do this with all of our teams now. Um, so don't walk away assuming that's the way Best Buy does everything. This is what we do on the edge. Um, a little bit on uh, what you've seen with Lisa, and I was really disappointed that Chris didn't have that Lisa slide with the road through the forest. I don't know if you guys have seen that. It's probably somewhere in North Carolina. This is my slide. As you see, there's a fork in the road. So we're going to talk about what's down this path. Uh, what's down this path is how do we virtualize and enable endpoints that don't exist yet? Well, what do I mean by don't exist? Um, we want to accomplish a function. We know that there's a data that we need to get at. We know that there's a business function that needs to exist, but we don't know how to find the data, what system the function lives in, how we can get at that data. We have a system catalog, right? We use Systemnet here, system catalog. On top of that, we have a staff of about 800 people that think they know where to go and get data. That's helpful. Um, if we don't find it in our system catalog, we start thinking of a new interface. We start developing and delivering that new interface. We also may not be clear of the exact data function. We know that the business wants to get something. Get me products with pricing with the most recent offer. But as Chris said, those things change all the time, right? The business comes back three weeks later and says, okay, I want pricing and offer, but give me it in the local store or give me it closest to this individual. Um, we may also not understand the interaction pattern of the service. We've deployed a number of services where the client was very specific in what they asked for. They knew that they needed a specific SLA. They knew that they needed specific data. But they intended to use it in a way that wasn't at all within their requirements. So they took a system back and said, well, we had a 1,500 millisecond response time desired. But what we really wanted to return was the last 11 years of a customer's transaction history. So we time out in 1.5 seconds, right? Sorry, your call can't be completed. Customer's transaction history over 11 years, if you're a really good Best Buy customer, that's into the thousands of interactions. It's a lot of data, highly variable. Well, we want to find that out before they go in production, before they call two weeks later and saying, it's failing 70% of the time before we get into all of those cases. So we want to understand that, and the way to that is kind of down the fork in the road here. What's down the fork in the road? Um, I'm going to tell a story a little bit about kind of climbing Mount Everest and doing what we're doing. Not that they're entirely synonymous, but there's things that tie together. Um, how could Mount Everest be similar to Best Buy? Um, it's an international endeavor. We build software all around the world. Folks come from all over the world to climb Mount Everest. Uh, no one climbs without support. Sherpas, oxygen, base camps, different ways up. They even have a great deal where you go up different camps, and as you get to the top, so it's kind of like, well, we built it in dev, we built it in stage, we built it in QA, and now we're at prod. We still have to get down the mountain to really finish it. But uh, So some of the analogy doesn't hold. 
no one seriously builds software without software configuration management, automated testing, environment configuration, management of kind of their configuration management database and configuration options. So we're somewhat similar. In the first 50 years of people trying to climb Mount Everest, there was only 28 people that made it. A lot died. In the last year that people tried to climb Mount Everest, they, 513 people made it. Only about five died. Best Buy, we have about four or 500 projects a year. We don't keep track of the ones that get left on the side. Um, delivering software at Best Buy, um, we have teams that need to work all together to get one chance to deliver something by a specific time. For us, that's holiday, right? Mount Everest is similar because they all have to get there within a two-week span of when they can summit safely and come back down. So we have the same goal, right? We can get there two or three days late, and it doesn't matter how in shape we are, how good the code is, it's too late. Two days after Black Friday, two days after Christmas, it doesn't matter if we had a great customer experience for January 3rd, right? Um, Everest really is kind of software delivery. It's a challenge of a lifetime, right? It's an achievable goal. Even your accountant these days may have climbed Mount Everest, right? It's not so crazy. It's not cloaked in this strange world. It's something that a lot of people can go and do. Same thing with software. We're not the guys in the computer science robes anymore hiding behind the, the mainframe or whatever we talked about earlier. Unix systems and things. And, using a totally different jargon and language. Business is moving into IT. IT is moving into business. That's been happening since day one. The velocity is what's changing. Uh, there's a science to summiting, and there's a science to software. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we do to get to the top. Lisa is just one of the tools we use to provide that developer support. We virtualize to create a real, quote unquote, interface. That real interface allows real interaction patterns. So we see what that person never gave us in the requirement. They never thought to tell us, oh, we'll be passing this ID. And that's the ID from their system. That's not the ID from the customer master system. That's their system. So the first couple of times they call, they say, why aren't we getting any results back? Well, we don't want to have that happen in production. We wanted them to do that early. So we understand what they're actually calling, what they're actually receiving. We want to agree on what that summit is and work our way from each side of the mountain up to the summit. The interfaces allow teams to, to build to that summit and arrive with some predictability, right? We get to finish, we get to complete along a predictable path. One of the things that drives that is test-driven development because we know as that team is building that interface and as our team is deploying that interface, as long as they're complying to what the virtualized service said, they're it becomes a self-referential or self-reinforcing model. Um, we seek to eliminate any consistencies along the way. We need to get there on time. We jump out of the gate at Best Buy in the spring. We rush till about October 31st. We force, lock all the systems down. And if you're really good, you try to jump in on freeze and cause all kinds of problems. Um, a little bit about how we, uh, how we do what we do. We do contract first. So one of our great SOA principles back from the 90s, contract first development. Understand the contract that you're going to deal with this consumer with. So we do contract first and we live that. Day two or three out of the gate from a business person saying, hey, I need an interface. Come and help my project. We have a contract. We have a service contract. It's made of request response pairs. We take those request response pairs and create a virtual, virtual service in Lisa. We may version the heck out of that thing before we're done. We're not trying to be perfect the first time. This isn't like the blind free throw from half court where you need, need to make it the first time. We practice a lot. We want to practice a lot. Um, those virtual stubs that we build are basically our rope lines. They go all the way to the top of the mountain. We may not have the energy to keep pushing to the top of the mountain, but we can tie off on the rope. Even if blinding snow, you can't see, you can't move, you tie up to the rope line, you keep moving forward to the top. We understand more and more about that interface. So it's un not uncommon to work for two or three weeks with an interface and say, you know what? We really thought we needed one service or one interface. We need six. We want these to work in a different pattern. I also understand it enforces my design principles 
that I am able to look at how a person is using an interface and I see them adding method upon method upon method on the interface and that becomes a bad thing for me. We build small atomic interfaces at Best Buy. We don't build large business consumable composite interfaces. So I'm allowed to do some like late entrant design work as well and say, I see how you're using the interface. I don't really like it. Let's break you into two interfaces. So we make multiple rope lines up there uh, to the surface. You still need to move forward, but you have a guide. The guide is that request response pair that makes that stub. We provide the virtual endpoints to be consumed by both the dependent team and the interface developer. The story that Chris was talking about, perfect story, great story, resonates probably with a lot of you, but it wasn't the problem that I had at Best Buy. The problem that I had is I needed to ha support the developer and support the team trying to consume it. Bring them both to the same point. Have them start working early from day two or three on what the actual contract is. I didn't want to get a spreadsheet of what the requirements are, a rec pro entry of the requirements. That's for you, Rob. Um, <laughs> uh, I didn't want to get a long requirements list and then try to figure out how I was going to shoehorn this in to a service, right? I'm starting from the wrong point. I want to start from that interface contract and work out. Um, the, the ladders really become our test-driven development. They help us get over incredible obstacles, right? The ladders, and I kind of like the picture here, the ladders are actually not one ladder, if you notice. They're kind of tied together. I don't know if I'd walk across it, but they seem to be doing a great job. Um, the ladders provide that test-driven development where we try and try and try. And once we actually are able to get across the chasm, we've met with some success. We're working our way up the mountain. Some things that we find with that continual testing. I mean, why do continual testing? Why not put it on the end, have a separate test team, outsource it for really inexpensive folks offshore or something, have them just test the heck out of it for the last month before you deliver, and then drop into delivery. That works great, right? So why would I want to kill that model? Um, we find issues early. Early issue identification. We find issues on day like four and five. We also find issues that the other team that we promised the interface to, we worked out the request response pairs, we built the service interface, isn't actually using it. We're watching what they do. So we want to enforce that agile pattern through all of the teams. Sometimes that won't work but it should be a goal or a guide. Uh, we change the contract prior to release. How many of you support SOA systems where you have the version one of the contract goes out and within 30 or 60 days there's 1.1? Okay, just one guy. Okay, cool. Um, so you and I can probably talk. Yeah, so it's a small fraternity, but it's a, it's a, a esprit de corps, really. Um, don't be afraid to version along the way. We build 10, 20, 30 different versions. We split the service. We aggregate the service. We do different message patterns with the service. We find out we need a composite um, message processor pattern. We need a splitter pattern. We need an aggregator pattern. All of these things come up as we're actually delivering. No one knew the solution well enough from the beginning to architect it well. So we had to work those through. Uh, we work to a better SLA. So folks come in the door. And they say, hey, we need a service. It's going to be in every one of our 1,104 stores. At every register, I need 1.8 million calls an hour. And I say, whew, what am I going to do with 1.8 million calls an hour? I need to stand up bigger hardware everywhere. Not just my service. It doesn't live in isolation. What I actually find with delivering the service early is that that team will eventually need 1.8 million an hour in seven years. They're doing a pilot right now. They're going to put it in three stores. They don't need 1.8 million. It's not going to be $8 million for me to deliver their project. It's a smaller project than they're saying. And I know that through their usage of the virtual service. They're going to go into a performance testing phase and they're going to want to use my virtual service. Their perf test is using 4,000 an hour. Well, I know something isn't jiving there. It helps me with a better SLA and SLO. We understand how they're going to use the service. I've already brought this up a couple of times. We get a better understanding of that interaction pattern. What we kind of don't address 
in all of this is that people are still people. Developers are still developers. It's a shaky, scary thing sometimes. And relying on people isn't enough. So we try to hold the tools accountable for understanding those interfaces between Lisa, between Systemnet, between other systems that we use to enforce those service contracts. We use static code analysis to make sure that the contract and the, and the service being delivered right to the team actually matches our design patterns, actually matches our logging. Is it connecting to our common logging framework? Is it connecting to the other things we need? And we do those early, so it doesn't go in production and need the 1.1 release of that service. Um, people equal problems or problems equal people. We try to remove the, well, that's not what I meant when I told you that we needed customer ID. I meant my customer ID, not their customer ID. Or, well, when I told you SKU, I really meant this other SKU, not the one you're thinking of. So we work all of those things out. We try to get to the end. The goal is to sum it. And when we sum it, we experience two things. Jason, I'll, we'll work something out later. Um, an understanding of the team that got you there. These pictures are all of somebody there by themselves. Someone took the picture. There's always a team that got them there. At Best Buy, when we deliver a project, there's always a team on the other side. All things are done in partnership. Nothing is done by a center of excellence, right, on their own. We also have an understanding of the achievement in itself, what we actually did and had to overcome. It helps us in better planning next time we have to go at something like that. Well, what did it take last time? Well, we versioned the interface 18 times. We had to find new data sets. We had to break that interface up. So we understand what it really took. And not from a post-mortem, because we already tried to deliver, it failed, and now we're having a post-mortem, but all along the way. It's much easier for us to solve a problem in August or September or early October than it is on December 15th. Exactly. Perfect. Um, we also understand that we're not there yet. Like I said earlier, you have to get down the mountain. I don't know if they count people that just got to the top or people that got to the top and down, but I'm sure there's maybe people that got to the top that didn't get down. So we eventually have to roll all this into production. Virtualization is great, and I can make my great little walled garden and bring everybody along. But I have to cut over to the real thing. Cutting over to the real thing is where we found some challenges as well. And we want to push those problems out as early as possible. There's a capability that Lisa has on the inside that says, hey, use the virtual service until the real things avail unless the real thing's available, and route them either to each or route them all to one or all to the other. That way we can start taking traffic on the virtual service. We don't have to tell the client to change anything, but the virtual service is now the real one. What have we done? Well, we've promoted our actual code into the environment that we're in. We haven't changed the, the endpoint. We haven't modified the client. They haven't had a ticket that went over to India that somebody changed something, or Mexico, or Malaysia, or whatever. All of that just happened, right, in us, in a controlled environment. We find out our code isn't working, we roll that right back. They didn't lose time on the virtual endpoint. So you might think that the story of kind of Mount Everest and building SOA services is, is maybe a lot too much machismo, and not really what we do in software development. And sure, I'll agree to that. But um, both Everest and ba Best Buy have something in common. And uh, my one plug for uh, Best Buy and maybe you joining is that the, gr the uh, view from the top is pretty awesome. And Best Buy is hiring. And you can go to careers.bestbuy.com and uh, learn how to sum it together. And uh, it's an interesting world here. We do some innovative things. Uh, we're in a unique place for any IT shop, and especially in the retail industry, and especially in the Midwest. So if there's any questions or anything, or if you guys would like to hit your phones or laptops right now with that, <laughs> go ahead. Thank you very much for your time.